Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our Saturday morning speaker series. Today, we'll be hearing from Liz Moore on eating healthy with Parkinson's. Just as we get started with the webinar, I wanted to make you all aware that we'll be recording this session. So if you want to go back and watch it on our YouTube channel later, I'll be sending the link out to everyone who could join today. Um, we'll be doing the presentation first, and then um, if you have any questions during the webinar, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask questions, and we'll be able to get to all of those at the end of the presentation. Um, and then just to introduce Liz, she's a registered dietitian at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, specializing in Parkinson's and Huntington's diseases and digestive disorders. Her goal is to make her patients feel supported, whether they have a new diagnosis or chronic disease. Today, she joins us to present on healthy eating with Parkinson's. Thanks so much for coming today, Liz. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here and speak to you all. Um, and um, it's strange doing this over Zoom where I don't see your faces, but um, I'm you know, definitely want to connect with you. So as, as we um, go through the, 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 the talk, make sure to add questions um, in the chat and we can definitely get to those um, at the end. I hope to cover quite a few different things, um, but again, if there's something that I don't cover or that you want to hear a little bit more in detail, um, please, please make sure to ask as we go along. So we're going to cover a couple different things today. Um, and, you know, I've been a registered dietitian now for about 19 years. Um, I've been here at Beth Israel, and um, I really do feel that working with patients one-on-one -on -one has been very helpful with managing their diseases, what, whatever they might be. Um, again, whether it's a new diagnosis or something that they've been dealing with for a while. Um, and I do feel like a lot of it is very personalized. So we're going to touch upon that as we talk today. A few topics that we're going to cover. Um, what does healthy look like? What does it mean to eat a healthy diet and how does that relate to Parkinson's? Um, fiber, what makes fiber such a great thing to have in your diet? How should we be choosing our fats in our diet? Vitamins and minerals, getting them from foods and from supplements. Bone health. We'll also be discussing Parkinson's medications and how that may impact your diet how we may have changes in our weight, both up or down, and how we may also have um, impacts on our appetite. Uh, we will talk about some bowel concerns. You know, when we talk about nutrition, we do need to um, address digestion, and that can definitely be associated with Parkinson's. Um, difficulty obtaining or preparing food for various reasons. How everything can kind of fit in in moderation. We'll touch upon that. And I do wanna spend some time talking about mindfulness, intuitive eating, and then looking ahead. So first thing I wanna talk a little bit about is what does healthy look like? And again, when it comes to Parkinson's, um, healthy can look different depending on um, what stage someone's in, other health concerns that they have, age, many different factors. So we would first wanna talk about nourishing um, our body, both from, for the health of our, our heart, our brain, our gut, but then also from a mental health perspective. So we talk about health as a, as a whole. It's not just one specific thing. Um, when we talk about nutrition, we wanna look at making sure that we're fueling our bodies so that we're getting enough calories, enough protein. Um, whenever we're getting those foods, we wanna make sure that we're getting enough throughout the day. Um, you know, maximizing our mobility, um, preventing any injury. So when we're not eating enough calories, our blood sugar levels may fall, our energy levels may not be adequate. So we wanna make sure that we're keeping our bodies safe. So fueling yourself in a way to provide yourself with enough calories. Now, in order to do so, we really wanna focus on foods that we should be getting more of. So as a dietitian, one huge goal that I have is to help people eat as liberally as they can while managing symptoms, while managing conditions. But if there are foods that they should, should be eating, then they should be eating those things. And when it comes to healthy foods, we wanna make sure that we're getting a lot of the good stuff. So we're gonna be talking a bit about benefits of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, beans and lentils, nuts and seeds, lean protein, healthy fat, a lot of these foods that nourish our body and provide a lot of different um, benefits to our health um, are really important to make sure that we include. Now, again, variety is so important. I don't want you to think of foods as good and bad. Um, you know, I think there are foods that we should be eating more often. There are foods that we should be eating daily. Um, when it comes to foods that are often looked at are viewed as bad foods or unhealthy foods, 
sometimes our favorite foods fall into those categories. So we don't necessarily want to restrict in a way that makes it feel like we have to have it be all or nothing. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this later on, but um, thinking about eating in more in moderation as opposed to feeling like you have to avoid certain things. Because, you know, we want to make sure that we're realizing that food is not just to nourish our body, but it also has a lot more to do with tradition and enjoyment and eating as a family, eating with friends. There's a lot more to food than, than just getting adequate calories and adequate nutrients. So when it comes to Parkinson's, you know, we want to make sure that we're eating as much variety as we can. We're eating all of these nourishing foods. But to say that there's a perfect Parkinson's diet is kind of, is, is difficult because everybody's situation is different. We're all different ages. We are all, we all have different conditions. Um, our gender is different. You know, there are def definitely different things that impact the, um, the needs that we have when it comes to nutrition. So we just want to make sure that, yes, we're taking in all of the recommendations and the, um, the, the general guidelines for health and healthy eating when it comes to Parkinson's, but we're also thinking about ourselves specifically. And also thinking about where we are with this diagnosis. Is this a new diagnosis? Is this something that we've been dealing with for years? So considering that all these factors, we wanna make sure that we're setting our goals to really fit our needs at that moment. So we wanna really think about it as an individualized thing. And we're gonna look at different things as we talk today, but I just want you to take just a quick second and think about what goal setting that you want to have? What does, what does health mean to you? And how do you want to approach health and maximizing those goals? So I'm just gonna pause for maybe about 30 seconds, whether you're jotted down on paper or you just take a mental note. But before we kind of dive into some of these, these nutrition recommendations, I want you to think about first, what goals you have for yourself when it comes to your health. I'm gonna move on to the topic of fiber. Now, you all know, likely know what fiber is. It's the undigestible part of plants that we, as we take it in, our body does different things with. We have different types of fiber. So soluble fiber is the type of fiber that forms almost like a gel in our system to help with bulking our stool and moving, kind of moving things through our digestive tract. An insoluble fiber is more of kind of, think of it as maybe a broom kind of sweeping through your system. And that's helping to really move bowels through and, um, and kind of keep, um, keep yourself from becoming constipated. And this is the type of fiber that tends to come from um, like nuts and seeds and the skin of uh, fruits and vegetables, um, you know, things that are really not getting broken down and absorbed in our system. The soluble fiber, um, this is kind of more what's, um, again, forming that so somewhat like a gel. So think of this as like oatmeal, the flesh of fruits and vegetables tends to have a little bit more soluble fiber. We need both. Both types of fiber can help with various different um, conditions. So it helps to stabilize our blood sugars. So when we eat and we eat a, a meal that has more fiber in it, we don't have these spikes and decreases in our blood sugar levels. And I'm not necessarily talking about someone who has diabetes because that of course has its um, concerns and, and needing to manage um, blood sugar, but even just from an energy perspective or the idea that we're trying to um, maximize our, our health and, and trying to make sure that we're eating foods and meals that satisfy us. So when we consume more sources of fiber, we're able to keep those blood sugar levels a bit more stable and consistent throughout the day. Um, fiber helps tremendously with gut health. So again, managing things like constipation. So typically the insoluble fiber is what helps to manage constipation because it softens stool and helps move stool, kind of move stool through our digestive tract. Um, the soluble fiber actually can help with diarrhea, where it kind of bulks up stool a little bit um, and, and makes it so that it, you're not having as frequent loose bowel movements. Um, 
Fiber also feeds the bacteria that naturally lives in our digestive tract. So when we're consuming a, di a diet that's rich in fiber, we're really enhancing that gut bacteria. And that's what kind of helps that, we call it the gut microbiome. So it's the idea that we have a healthy digestive tract from an environmental standpoint. And our gut microbiome can, can change from time to time. Um, as we age, it changes. It can change if we have a bad digestive bug. Um, there can be different things that affect it. So adjusting your fiber for various reasons can be really helpful here. Fiber has been shown to be really helpful for heart health. So um, a high fiber diet has been known to lower cholesterol. It actually helps to bind some of the cholesterol to kind of move through our system. Um, when someone is trying to lose weight, eating a diet rich in fiber can help keep you more satisfied at meals um, to help with portion control. Now, if someone is losing weight where they need to gain weight, they can still manage to get good sources of fiber in their diet, but maybe fiber that is more um, softened. So just the example of, you know, thinking of a, a salad versus maybe some cooked vegetables. That salad is going to take more space in your stomach. So it, if you feel like you're getting overly full from that and it's taking up a lot of space in the sense that you're not able to fit in other foods at that meal, it's a good idea to, you know, try to balance those sources of fiber and do maybe softer fibers like cooked fiber, cooked fruits and vegetables as a way to, um, to have a little bit more space for other foods when you're consuming them. Now, which foods contain fiber? Um, again, plant-based foods, um, fruits, vegetables, nuts and seeds, beans and lentils, and whole grains. So when we increase our fiber in our diet, we want to make sure that we're doing it slowly. Because if we went from eating a certain amount of fiber to then all of a sudden having these major sources of fiber, then we're probably going to feel uncomfortable. We're going to have some bloating and gassiness. You know, it might affect our bowel habits in the sense that we may start having some, some more looser stool um, kind of out of nowhere. Um, so when we're trying to increase our fiber intake, we want to make sure that we're doing it slowly. So starting off by maybe adding in a vegetable, a small salad or um, a cooked vegetable at dinner time. Maybe adding a piece of fruit with our lunch if we, were, we didn't have that there already. Maybe if you're having soup, maybe adding some beans or lentils into that soup. Um, you know, th those are a great way to kind of get a little bit more of that fiber, but also a good source of protein as well. When we're talking about whole grains, you know, the obvious whole grain that I think we look at is the difference between maybe white bread and whole wheat bread. So of course, a, you know, a good option to incorporate whole wheat bread, but we can get whole grains from lots of various grains as well. So we can get, um, we can incorporate grains like quinoa, or we can switch to brown rice. Um, we can use farro or amaranth, millet. These are all grains that do have a, a rich amount of fiber in them that maybe are a little bit different than kind of the standard sources that we might be used to. Um, when it comes to nuts and seeds, you know, maybe throwing in a sprinkle of nuts into your cereal, maybe having, um, you know, a little extra, um, you know, some seeds or some chia seeds in your yogurt. So there can be some really good ways. So you know, take a quick second and maybe think about somewhere where you could add in fiber, um, maybe with your lunch today. Where's, what is something that you might be able to include that would have a good source of fiber? Moving on to the topic of fat. Now, I think fat has a little bit of a bad reputation because, you know, thinking about fat over the years and, and kind of its, its reputation back in the you know, 80s and 90s, I think there was such a focus on fat as being something that made us fat or caused us to gain weight. Um, and that's not the case. We do need fat in our diet. And, you know, it's the idea that we want to make sure that we're choosing the fats that are the healthiest for us. Um, you know, fats that come from, um, from plants or fish are going to be our best choices. Um, we have a couple different types of fats. So we have saturated fats and unsaturated fats. Saturated are the ones that come from animal meat and animal products. 
And by saying that these aren't as desirable as the unsaturated fats is probably where I want to kind of stand and not necessarily that you have to avoid them. Saturated fats are not meant to be avoided. Um, but if you have a heart condition, you have high cholesterol, um, you know, these are the types of fats that you do want to decrease a bit, but still getting those sources of fats because fats can be so helpful in our diet. So maybe just shifting your intake of fats more from the saturated into the unsaturated. And the unsaturated are going to come more from plants. So again, nuts like peanut butter, almonds, walnuts, and then their associated butters that come along with them. So almond butter, peanut butter, um, seeds. So sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, they even make seed butters as well. Things like avocados. Avocados are a wonderful source of these unsaturated fats. But then we also get fat from um, fatty fish, which are going to be in the form of the omega-3 fatty acids. And these are found in the fish that, again, have a, a fattier flesh to them. So think about things like salmon and tuna, mackerel. Um, maybe not everybody's top choice, but if you are able to get some of these in your diet, then you're going to benefit from some of those omega-3 fatty acids that are so helpful for our, again, heart health, um, for our brain health. Um, and again, just overall shifting into those unsaturated fats and omega-3 fats compared to the saturated. Now the saturated, again, from animal meat and animal products. So this is the fat that you visibly see on beef or pork. This is the fat that's going to be in high fat dairy products, the fat that's in butter. We can still get those fats. Those are actually fine to have in the diet, but from a standpoint of trying to benefit from um, making some shifts in our diet, getting more of the unsaturated fats are going to be really helpful. I have to get asked a lot about vitamins and minerals, whether or not um, someone should take a supplement um, or should we just be getting these, these vitamins and minerals through our diet. Now, in an ideal world, we want to get our vitamins and minerals from our diet. Now, when, in order to do that, we need to make sure that we're getting a good variety. So for example, kind of going back to those foods that we talked about that were rich in fiber, um, fruits and vegetables, um, we, the, the different colors that we consume, the more variety of vitamins and minerals we're going to get. Um, not restricting or limiting your diet significantly. If we're cutting out a major category of food, then we're off, likely not getting the, the vitamins and minerals that come with it. So really assessing if you do need to restrict your diet, and we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes, but if you do, do need to restrict your diet or you do need to um, kind of avoid a certain category of foods, then you, know, you want to consider the, the vitamins that you might be missing from that and talking to your doctor or dietitian a little bit about some of the things that you might be lacking. So when you see your doctor, oftentimes blood work will be taken. Um, if your doctor is not routinely checking, you know, general nutrition labs, um, it is something that can be really helpful, especially if you do have limitations in your diet. Um, we'll be talking about some things that are more commonly um, lacking in our diet in just a moment. Um, but when it comes to supplementing, we often will focus on the things that are depleted to supplement. So, you know, working closely with your doctor and dietitian to replete anything that has been deficient. So for example, if you get your blood work done and your vitamin B12 is low, supplementing B12 until that level comes back to normal. And also trying to figure out, you know, why is this level low? Does it have to do with like a chronic condition? Does it have to do with your diet and maybe not eating certain foods? And if there's if the ability to do something with your diet first, that's always the kind of the, the best option. So if you're avoiding something unnecessarily and you're able to bring that back into your diet, then it is helpful to have that, again, that variety in order to get um, all those vitamins and minerals as much as you need. Supplementation with vitamins and minerals is extremely individualized. So this is where it gets tricky with streamlined nutrition recommendations. Um, what's helpful for one person might not be beneficial for someone else. And there are certain vitamins and minerals we don't want to over supplement. So we don't necessarily want to take something just out of the sake of, oh, let me just give this a try and take this. You know, you always want to make sure you're checking with your provider and just and, and checking values and making sure that if you do decide to supplement with something for whatever reason, that you're keeping an eye on the blood value that's associated with that. 
Now, there are some specific diets, as I was kind of saying before, specific reasons why someone might need to limit um, things in their diet. So, for example, people who are vegetarian or vegan for different reasons, you know, will be lacking in certain nutrients. So we want to make sure that we're being careful of either finding those nutrients from somewhere else or taking a supplement. People who have significant food allergies or food intolerances um, might need to avoid certain categories of foods. So making sure, again, that we're either finding something that's fortified with that vitamin or supplement or, coming, or excuse me, vitamin or mineral and it's coming from somewhere else, um, or again, we supplement as needed. But again, anytime you're taking a supplement, you want to stay on top of why am I taking this? How long do I need to take this? Am I continuing to check a level in order to um, figure out if I do still need to take this and going from there? Now, I want to talk a little bit about bone health. Um, now, bone health and Parkinson's can be kind of a, there can be a connection there. Um, oftentimes with Parkinson's, when there's decreased mobility, there can be some associated decreased bone health. Um, some people who unintentionally lose weight may have a decrease in their bone health. So there can be some connecting factors there. So it is something that we need to be mindful of. Now, bone health can be something that, I mean, really something that anybody needs to look at. As we age, we often have a thinning of our bones. Women are more at risk at times to have um, kind of a lower bone density and that can lead to osteoporosis. So when it comes to our bone density, our bone health, you know, really staying on top of it and seeing if there is anything that we need to do more so than um, what we're getting from our diet. So specifically calcium, you know, again, calcium helps to aid bone health and strengthen our bones. Um, we want to get this, you know, ideally through our diet, but if we need to, we want to incorporate some supplements. Now, there are food, plenty of foods that are rich in calcium. So uh, typically the most common ones are going to be dairy products, also some fortified foods. Um, but we can also get some calcium from like leafy greens and nuts and grains, but typically those are not our major sources. Now, dairy products like milk and cheese and yogurt are great sources, um, but what about somebody with lactose intolerance or somebody with a dairy allergy? We need to consider them. Um, now, nowadays, there are so many different options with some of our plant-based milks. Now, those don't naturally have calcium in them. Companies are aware of this and are realizing that people who are utilizing these products are usually needing to get that calcium, so they will fortify those. Now, we need about 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams a day of total calcium through our diet and or supplement. Now, this is where, again, you know, working with someone to kind of assess how much calcium you're getting in your diet can be really helpful because, again, it's very individualized. Our body can only absorb about 500 milligrams of calcium at one time. So, for example, if you were to have a bowl of cereal for breakfast, um, you want to make sure that you're you're either not taking a calcium supplement at that exact same time, or you're spacing out any other sources of calcium that you might be having. So for example, calcium fortified orange juice. Um, I recently had a patient who was um, really trying to maximize her calcium absorption and or get, and get, get enough calcium throughout the day. And she was incorporating calcium fortified orange juice and fortified almond milk, but she was doing them at the same meal. So in, in, in an ideal world, separating those two would be really helpful in order to make sure that she's getting as much as she can from each of those, um, each of those fortified foods. So if you're able to kind of separate things throughout the day, um, it, it equates to about three servings a day, the 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams. So if you think about that and again, spacing those out throughout the day, that could be a helpful way to look at it. If you do need a calcium supplement, um, there are a few different types of calcium. Calcium carbonate tends to be the kind of the more easily available source, um, but calcium citrate is a little bit more easily absorbable. So for people who have maybe some digestive problems, they tend to find calcium citrate to be a little bit easier on the stomach. So this could be, again, a conversation to have with your provider about which is the better source. Um, but first assessing if you, feel like, if you feel like you are getting enough in your diet, because there is a chance that you likely are if you are incorporating some of these foods. Um, it may take some, some um, intention of making sure that you are incorporating them, but chances are that if you are incorporating these foods, you are getting enough. Now, vitamin D is a little bit trickier. So vitamin D kind of working alongside of calcium helps with maximizing our bone health. Not a lot of foods have vitamin D. So there's only a few foods that, that really have vitamin D. So fatty fish, 
There's a little bit in things like egg yolks, um, but there, it's supplemented in some dairy products and fortified cereals. Now, where we live in New England, um, and I'm, I'm not sure if I'm now being over Zoom again, I'm not sure your location, if you are, if you happen to be in um, the Boston area like I am, um, we don't get a lot of that impact um, from the sun because our, our body does make vitamin D from sunlight. Um, but in New England, from about October to May, we're not really at the right angle of the sun to really maximize vitamin D production from the sun. So oftentimes people in this area can be deficient. Um, so again, figuring out if you do need a supplement, um, and this can be based on your vitamin D, your, love, your blood levels when you get, get them tested at the doctor. So vitamin D is something that I would recommend getting checked um, annually with your annual physical and seeing if you do in fact require that vitamin D supplementation. Um, some other ways to prevent bone loss. Um, you know, really trying to your best to prevent any unintentional weight loss. I know that can be difficult at times, um, but we'll talk about, actually talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. Um, but when it comes to um, our, our body mass, when we unintentionally lose weight, we often are losing some of that bone mass as well and muscle mass. So we want to try to keep our weight stable um, and not unintentionally lose any weight. Avoiding smoking and excessive alcohol intake can also help our bone health. And then there's a lot of a lot of really strong benefits with our physical activity and maintaining strong bones. So at whatever level you're at, finding ways to keep your body moving. So simple walking can be really helpful, um, whether it's classes that you enjoy taking, a little bit of light weight training, um, just keeping your body moving and using, you know, kind of your your weight, your body as a weight bearing, um, you know, thing in, in terms of incorporating exercise. So walking is considered to be a weight bearing exercise that can help with bone health. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, shifting into Parkinson's and a Parkinson's medication. So I know we talked a bit about foods that we want to incorporate, vitamins and minerals we want to incorporate, um, but as we talk about eating a lot of variety in our diet, eating plentifully, making sure we're getting um, a, a lot of nourishment from calories and protein and fat and vitamins and minerals, we need to take into consideration that those people who are on a, a medication for Parkinson's, levodopa specifically, um, there is a little bit, oh, did I go back? Um, I think I went one slide too far. You see how to go back here? Oh, there we go, perfect. Um, so we want to just be mindful of the idea that levodopa actually does compete with protein in our diet. So what that means is when we're taking our protein, our, um, our Parkinson's medication that contains levodopa, we don't want to take that at the same time that we're consuming a major source of protein. Because when we consume them at the same time, it's not that it's harmful, we're just not maximizing the way that that medication is working. Because the protein and the medication are kind of being absorbed similarly at the same time, and something's going to get pushed out of the way. And usually it's the medication and our body takes in that protein. So when it comes to this, this can get a little bit tricky because this medication is often, um, you know, it, it given multiple times throughout the day. That's how the dosing works. So to really get the optimal benefit of this medication, we want to try to make sure to have our source of protein about 30 to 60 minutes, both before and after this, this dose of medication. This can get a little bit tricky. So I'm going to talk about this a, a little bit more in detail in a second. But the first thing I wanted to say is, as you're trying to shift this around, don't change the timing of your medication. Your doctor depends on the timing and the dosing and the spacing of your medication to best assess how well it's helping and helping manage your symptoms, and then whether or not that dose needs to be adjusted. So what we wanna do is we want to make sure that we're kind of assessing first where our protein is coming from. Now, protein is in foods like meat and poultry, fish, nuts and seeds, beans and lentils, eggs, dairy products. These are all sources of protein. And we have to think about kind of where some of these foods are. So if you're having a sandwich that's with tuna fish and a slice of cheese, the tuna fish and the cheese are the, slice of, are the source of protein. If we're making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, that peanut butter is that source of protein. So we really want to try to first assess where our sources of protein are and then look at the day as a whole 
and look at the timing of those med the, the, the dosing of your medication. Now, you can eat when you're having your medication. So ideally, this will be a, a, a snack or a meal that does not contain protein. So something simple, slice of toast with jam, some fruit, fresh fruit or dried fruit, some crackers, something like that. So typically more of like a snack might be helpful as opposed to it being a meal. So again, looking at what the day looks like, looking at when you're getting your sources of protein and maybe shifting a little bit your meal times as you're kind of planning around those doses of medication. Now, um, it is important to still make sure that you're getting enough protein throughout the course of the day. Um, I had a patient that I, I as, as I talk, I'm going to be kind of talking about a few, um, a few situations of certain specific patients, because I think it's helpful to see kind of how it can affect people. Um, I had a gentleman I, um, I was working with, and he wasn't aware of the connection of needing to be mindful of his source of protein with his medication, and he was taking this medication four times a day. Um, but the, the tricky part was, was that the way his work schedule was, was that there are some mornings he had to be in his office at 6 a.m. and other mornings where he didn't have to be in his office until 9 a.m. So he took advantage of the mornings that he didn't have to be in until 9 a.m. and caught up a little bit on his sleep. So he wasn't waking up at the exact same time during every day. So he wasn't taking his medication the exact same time every day. So I think this was stressing him out a little bit because he wasn't sure how to go about adjusting his, his meal patterns. So what we did was we talked about the idea that the timing of his medication should stay the same. And as he's going about and planning his day, it's not that it mattered as much the exact time that the, the meal was eaten and the medication was taken, but most importantly, the spacing of that. So that the spacing of those doses stayed the same and that he was maneuvering his meals around that. Now, again, as I mentioned, we need protein. We don't want shift, making these shifts to to, um, to restrict our overall protein intake throughout the day. So it does take a little bit of planning accordingly um, because if we're not getting enough protein, we might not be getting enough overall calories, which could lead to some unintentional weight loss, which is something I wanna talk a little bit about. Unintentional weight loss is tough. It can be common with people with Parkinson's. Um, it can happen for various reasons. Um, changes in your, um, in your appetite can affect this. Changes in your ability to effectively chew and swallow foods can affect this. Um, and actually, while I'm mentioning that, I do want to just briefly touch upon that so that as we're talking about some shifts to making your diet, not only foods, but we also need to consider the consistencies of our foods. So if you feel like you're having any um, difficulty with manipulating food and chewing food or swallowing food, first of all, I would mention it to your doctor and figure out you know, what might be causing this. And you know, really reaching out to resources. Um, speech and swallow therapists are wonderful for helping assess safety of food, um, but also giving tips for um, managing these symptoms as well. So they may give some tips and they may say that it's absolutely fine from a safety perspective for you to eat your regular diet, but maybe some tips of how to keep foods moistened and maybe taking some sips with bites or eating slowly um, so, or, or um, practicing some certain swallowing strategies might be a way to kind of manage this. So again, working with these, with these specialists can often be helpful because we don't want you to be in a position where you're having some unintentional weight loss based off of any difficulty chewing or swallowing. Now, when again, when we have this unintentional weight loss, we need to think about ways to increase our calories. Now, it's easy to say, just eat more, right? But that's not easy. People find that increasing weight after they've unintentionally lost weight is very difficult. It is not easy to increase your weight. So you have to make a strong effort to add more calories throughout the course of the day with certain foods. Um, we often look to higher fat foods to provide us more rich calories without adding a lot of volume. So for example, uh, maybe adding a little bit of extra peanut butter on your toast in the morning for breakfast or um, slicing up an avocado on your salad or putting an avocado in with your rice to add a little bit of extra calories. Sometimes it can be as simple as being more liberal with your oil when you're cooking. 
So for example, if you're making soup and you're having vegetables, there's maybe some chicken in, chicken or beans in the soup, um, grab whatever oil you're using, olive oil, canola oil, and just add a swirl before you consume it, before you eat it. And that can add in a couple extra hundred calories depending on how much you're adding in, but it's not as adding extra volume. So I think that's important because when you're trying to gain weight, it's not, it's not easy to add in more volume necessarily, but we can sneak in those extra calories that way. Also incorporating some snacks between your meals. So if you're someone who typically doesn't snack, maybe just having a couple little bites or um, you know, a handful of something between, between meals can be a really helpful way. Um, I had a patient that I was working with and she was very frustrated that you know, we had a few visits and she was trying to gain some weight and she really got stuck. And she, each time that we checked back in, her weight was just stuck, stuck at where it was. It wasn't going up, it wasn't going down, but she was really putting in a lot of strong effort. And one thing I said to her was when you're trying to gain weight, especially after a weight loss, when you're able to stabilize that weight, that's a huge success. You need to consider the fact that even if you're not actively gaining weight, if you're maintaining your weight and preventing any further weight loss, that's considered to be successful. So making sure to you know, applaud yourself for those successes as well, even if it's not quite where you want to be back to the weight that you were, we still need to realize that if you're not actively losing weight any longer, that's wonderful. Um, I put the, the idea of kind of building a high calorie frap or smoothie on here. I put a recipe for um, my favorite, a chocolate peanut butter milkshake. Um, but basically this can be anything and this can be a blank canvas. So start with a base, maybe milk or juice, and then adding in something else, adding in some yogurt, adding in some cocoa powder, nut butters go really well in these smoothies. Add in some fruit for some different flavors. Depending on how thick you like the smoothie or the frap, um, add in a little extra ice and blend it. So there are some options for some store-bought nutritional supplements. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Boost or Ensure or lots of various versions of these, um, but sometimes those aren't necessarily affordable or um, as tasty. So if you have access to a blender and you're able to put a smoothie together at home, that can be just as beneficial. Now, when you're consuming something like this, I would recommend not having, sitting down and just drinking a tall glass of a smoothie because it can fill you up pretty quickly. So I think the idea of making sure that you're, um, you know, you're sipping on it and you're spacing it out throughout the day so that you're not filling up too quickly at one time. Now, if you're experiencing unintentional weight gain, which can also be very common, my First and foremost recommendation is do not be hard on yourself. There can be very many, there can be many reasons why our weight increases. And I think when weight goes up and we're not intending for it to go up, we're hard on ourselves for saying, what am I doing wrong? What am I overeating? Uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm really not eating that much. And so there can be very, there can be many different reasons why your weight goes up. But I think it's also assessing that, you know, it's not necessarily about the scale. And I put a picture of a scale on here. Um, but I think it's important to realize that it doesn't have to do with the scale necessarily. We're looking at health. Maybe a few extra pounds was okay. Maybe you needed a few extra pounds. There's nothing wrong with your weight fluctuating and there, there doesn't have to be an exact number that your weight stays at. So realizing that it can be a little bit more fluid than an exact number. Um, but in, in terms of looking at weight loss and, and weight loss goals, so sometimes a goal can be just all right, well, my weight went up, let me just stay here. Let me just focus on not increasing weight even more. Or if you're in a position where you'd like to lose weight, you know, setting some small goals for yourself and looking at long-term goals, of course, but even some short-term goals. So maybe your first goal is just to reduce two or three pounds in order to kind of get out of a certain weight range, even though, again, the number doesn't necessarily matter. So, the idea is, is not being hard on yourself, not feeling like you're a failure by any means, um, not feeling like you have to make dramatic changes in order to um, have your weight shift back down, but looking at short-term goals, but also long-term goals. Um, if you feel like you need to do something drastic for your weight to decrease, then 
that's the type of weight loss that's not going to be maintained. So for example, someone who, you know, really restricts calories to help their weight drop down and they lose, you know, 10, 15 pounds in a month or two, that's likely weight that's not going to stay off. So when we're looking at our long-term plan, that 10, 15 pound decrease over the course of a year is more likely going to stay off than someone who lost that more rapidly. Um, I want to talk a little bit about bowel habits. Now, there can be changes in bowel habits um, with Parkinson's, and um, unfortunately, it tends to lean more towards the idea of constipation. So everybody's very different with their bowel habits. I also want to make sure to address the fact that there's a very wide range of normal. So if you feel like there's been a change, so it's more that if there's a change in your bowel habits, that's the concern, as opposed to there are people who have bowel movements twice a day, there are people who have bowel movements, you know, once every three or four days. Both can be very normal, but it's more just looking at what's normal for you. So if you do feel like there has been a significant change, then talking to your provider a little bit about maybe why that change has happened and what we can do about that. From a nutritional perspective, fiber is something that can be very helpful with um, really managing our constipation. So slowly bumping up your fiber, fiber intake can be really helpful. Um, sometimes a fiber supplement can be really, it can be helpful as well, or some type of bowel regimen to kind of keep our bowels moving more regularly. I wouldn't recommend starting something just right off the bat, but again, assessing why this change has happened and maybe um, you know, brainstorming with your provider a little bit more about why this is happening and what can be the best approach to manage it. Now, one thing I have not touched upon that I wanted to really spend a minute or two talking about here is hydration. So hydration can be extremely important with managing constipation, but also from, uh, for other various health reasons as well. Um, staying adequately hydrated can really keep our bowels moving more regularly. And if we're increasing fiber in our diet, we definitely need to make sure that we're increasing our water. So when we're adding fiber to our diet, fiber brings in that water to kind of help soften the stool and move, you know, our digestion like moves that, the, that stool forward. So if we're not getting enough in enough water, that fiber isn't getting softened enough and isn't moving enough. So that can be kind of a contraindication of increasing fiber. So definitely trying to drink plenty of water. Now, this is something that is a very wide ranged question in the sense that what is enough water for me? Um, this, there is no exact answer. You know, there's the recommendation of six to eight cups per day. Um, but we also have to realize that other things hydrate us too. It's not just water, juices, um, teas, things like that. Typically caffeine, we don't consider to be as much of a hydrator, um, but it also, you know, does provide some fluid. So my recommendation with that would be, you know, see where you are with your water intake or your fluid intake to begin with. Um, also look for signs of dehydration. So the color of your urine can be a telling factor. Kind of a darker, deeper yellow tells us that you're likely more dehydrated. A light yellow or clear um, pee can be more indicative of being more hydrated. Um, so kind of, keeping, kind of keeping an eye on things like that. And if you're trying to increase your intake, um, again, don't feel like it has to happen all at once. Do it over time. Um, slowly drink a little bit more throughout the course of the day. Um, ideally, don't sit down to a large amount at one time, but more think about sipping throughout the course of the day. Um, getting back to managing constipation, um, there was a study that recently come out, came out about um, diet and constipation. Um, and there actually was the suggestion of people eating two kiwi a day to help with managing constipation. So kiwi does provide fiber, um, but there's something about kiwi that seemed to really help the, um, the people in the study have more um, kind of more regular bowel movements. So kiwi are delicious. Maybe not the easiest in-season fruit to find year round, um, but when people are trying to increase their fiber or manage their constipation through their diet, I throw this suggestion their way. And if they happen to like kiwi, great. If they don't like kiwi, then we kind of move on to something else. Um, but it's worth a, shot, uh, worth a shot. Also, um, abdominal massage and relaxation can be really helpful when it comes to trying to manage constipation. So the idea of you know, taking time for deep breathing, 
um, if you're, you're, you tend to be more impacted, kind of moving and manipulating, um, you know, kind of in your belly can be helpful. Um, you know, things that can really kind of move bowels more regularly are movement, relaxation, um, and, and, and a, a kind of, um, fiber in our diet to really help with that. So exercise as you're able can kind of keep our digestive tract moving and, and functioning properly. Um, so that can be something to focus on as well. Now, I just wanted to briefly touch upon the idea of maybe some difficulty um, grocery shopping and obtaining food in order to make some of these dietary changes. Now, there can be so many different reasons for this. And I think these last few years of the height of COVID really brought a lot of this to, to the table because many people were not able to get out or um, really just were not interested in going grocery shopping during the time when we were really under kind of that shutdown of the pandemic. So, the nice thing about that has come out of this is the utilization of grocery delivery services, um, having something like a, like a, a stop and shop delivery or um, Whole Foods doing um, deliveries through Amazon, um, Instacart. So really taking this on as something that might be helpful for you. If grocery shopping is difficult um, in relation to Parkinson's, just getting, getting to the store, moving around the store, getting things in your cart, um, absolutely utilizing these services as much as you need to. If you're able to buy in bulk and have things delivered or having some help getting things, that's also really helpful. Now, when it comes to preparing food, you know, it, there can be different, different limitations here. So maybe some difficulty with chopping or um, washing food and, and kind of getting food prepared to be used for in a recipe. Maybe it's the idea of um, standing at the stove for a longer period of time um, in preparing something. So again, utilizing resources around you. You know, prepare food when you're able to, but you know, purchasing things that are already cut and washed and ready to use Frozen vegetables can often be helpful. Thinking about frozen broccoli, for example, as opposed to a head of broccoli that needs to be washed and chopped and then cooked, you know, using frozen broccoli in a recipe kind of eliminates some of that, um, that difficulty that might come along with that. Or sometimes even buying things that are partially prepared. Um, a lot of foods offer salad bars that have, you know, things that are already prepared or even things that are partially made. Um, I'm thinking of, I think it's Uncle Ben's that makes like a parboiled rice. So really all you need to do is, is warm it up. You can make it right in the microwave as opposed to sitting at the stovetop and having to stir um, a pot of rice. So these can all be really beneficial. So I touched upon this earlier in, in, the, um, in the talk, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about the idea of everything in moderation. So when it comes to healthy, we want to think about our physical health, but our mental health too. So if there are foods that we love, there do not need to be hard and fast rules that we follow with, with, with um, eating them versus not eating them, not thinking of foods as good and bad. We want to choose foods for their nutritional value, of course, but there's a lot more to it than that. You know, food isn't just, you know, a, a collection of vitamins and minerals and macronutrients that we're consuming. There's so much more to it. You know, tradition comes along with food, enjoyment and going out to eat or enjoying a meal with friends or family, um, you know, having certain certain little traditions that we do. Maybe there's a, somewhere we go that is associated with stopping for ice cream on the way home. There can be many things that we do that provide a lot of enjoyment when it comes around food. So unless you have to restrict a food, don't feel like you have to avoid a food that's not considered to be your healthiest option. Now, yes, of course, let's make room for these nutritious foods that provide us these, these rich calories and protein and healthy fat that we need, these vitamins and minerals. Um, but I think as long as we're making the effort to do that, there is room for these other foods and we wanna make sure that we're making that room. The last topic I really wanted to talk about with you today was the idea of intuitive eating and mindfulness. So as a dietitian, over the last few years, this has really come to be a big part of our practice because, again, we want to make sure that people are looking at eating as nourishing, of course, but also the idea that there's a lot more to it than that. And when we feel like we have to follow certain strict diets for various reasons, um, you know, it can kind of take away a lot of that enjoyment. So the term intuitive eating, you know, by definition is, you know, trusting your body to make choices that feel good for you and not judging yourself if you do choose to consume a food maybe that isn't 
on the top list of most healthy foods. Um, it's trusting your hunger. So not ignoring your hunger and saying, you know, I shouldn't be hungry right now, so I'm not gonna have something to eat. If you're hungry, by all means, have something to eat. And feeling like you're in control of that. So again, nobody should be feeling like they need to follow the clock for eating or, you know, I know we were talking about protein, but that, that's kind of a very specific thing. But in terms of, you know, if you feel like you do need a snack, you know, not feeling like you have to um, avoid that for a various reason. Um, I'm going to use my last kind of patient example. I had a gentleman who, you know, he, he was trying to kind of look at his, his weight um, as, you know, not wanting to gain more weight, but he was really hard on himself because he said, you know, I, I feel like in the evening, I just sit and snack. And so we talked a little bit about that. And I said, well, what, what about this time, you know, makes you feel like snacking? He's like, I worked a long day, you know, we had dinner, you know, finally I'm able to sit down and relax and I just want to enjoy something that tastes good and that I can actually like think about eating as opposed to rushing through the day and having these foods and not really tasting them or feeling like that was part of um, an enjoyable process. But now I want to sit and enjoy something. So the idea is, is that this is okay. You know, it's okay to sometimes eat out of comfort or eat out of emotion or eat out of boredom. Um, but I think it's important to really kind of be in tune and, and mindful of this and say, okay, well, you know, am, am I eating just to eat or am I eating for another reason? And there can be reasons that don't necessarily, you know, match up with hunger or something specific. Um, and again, it is okay to eat in those times. So him and I, we spoke a little bit about the idea that if he's hungry, eat. If he feels like he wants to sit and have the comfort of enjoying a snack at that time, that's totally fine. But one of the things that he felt maybe would be helpful is to feel more in control then. So we decided to make a list of things that would be some, you know, some helpful snacks that he could have at that point. So maybe some things that provided him with a little bit more nourishment, um, maybe something that he really enjoyed the flavor of. But then also the idea of just kind of staying within kind of a mindful portion. So instead of bringing the bag of potato chips to the couch with him, he would pour a small bowl, but then he'd also have maybe some almonds to go with it. So it's really trying to figure out what works best for you and setting those specific goals. So I kind of put down a few questions that I'd love for you to think about. You know, are you enjoying your meals or are you eating just to eat? I think a lot of times we do go through a busy day and we're not really thinking about what we're eating, but we're just like, oh, I got to eat this lunch so I can get on to the next thing. Um, instead, kind of practicing more mindfulness and the idea of, you know, are you noting the taste of foods? Are you thinking about ingredients that go into it? So, for example, when you're eating a soup, recognizing, oh, I taste some rosemary in here. Oh, I, like, I really like rosemary. So this, this is tasty, but recognizing why you're enjoying it. And then also, do you rush through meals, even if you're not in a rush? I mean, there are times where, you know, there are four minutes on the clock before next patient or something like that, where it's like, I need to eat this quick and there's really not much enjoyment that comes with it. And that's okay. Um, but in the situation where you're not in a rush, are you still kind of practicing that quick eating without really taking a moment to taste your food and enjoy your food? And then lastly, just a few kind of takeaway thoughts that I'd love for you to kind of consider. So focusing on your health as a whole, so looking at health as nourishment, as um, energizing, looking at health from different perspectives of brain health, mental health, physical health, things like that. Nourishing your body with lots of nutritious foods, but also making sure that if the foods you love don't fit into this kind of ideal nutritious food box, there is room for those foods in your diet. Um, utilizing resources that are available to you. You know, if you require the need for a speech and swallow therapist, if sitting and meeting with a dietitian would be helpful to review your diet. Um, you know, talking to your doctor if there are resources that you're, you know, you could use, but you're not sure that are available. You know, um, occupational therapy, physical therapy, social work. There are so many resources um, kind of in this Parkinson's world that you know, if you're not utilizing them, considering if you do need them or could benefit from them. As obstacles come up, take them in stride and also focus on what you actually have control over and trying to maximize your health through what you have control over um, versus feeling, you know, feeling down or feeling upset about what you don't. And then really try to always keep a smile on your face. 
All right, so we're going to move on to some questions. And there were actually two questions that were submitted that I want to answer first. And then we'll get into some of the questions that might be um, kind of given here. So I'm going to read off my paper, just the first, the, the first one that was given. And then I'll answer it, and then we'll go from there. So the question was, I have substituted plant-based cheese for cheese I used to eat, and I'm trying to, and I'm trying to incorporate plant-based ground beef as well. However, I worry that these products may contain ingredients that are not good for me. Am I causing myself more harm by making these changes in my diet? Are all cheese and meat substitutes the same, and are some better than others? That is a great question. So I think my my first question to the the, the writer of the question would be. You know, asking yourself why you're incorporating these alternatives. So, for example, if it's for um, an allergy, for, for example, or because you are following a vegetarian or vegan diet, then, you know, we can kind of look at it from one angle. But if you're trying to just eat healthier or make healthier choices, you don't have to take these foods out of your diet, but instead maybe just looking at how frequently you're having them and the portion sizes that you're having. So, you know, if you're, um, if you're following, a, a, let's say, a vegan or vegetarian diet or have an allergy, then there's more of a place for these foods. Um, there are some ingredients I wouldn't consider to be harmful by any means, um, but there are, are a lot of ingredients in these foods. So if you are able to have them along with more whole foods, like more fruits and vegetables, beans, lentils, kind of incorporate them within the meal as opposed to just having them on their own, that would be helpful. Um, but again, if you're trying to just make some healthy alternatives in your diet and you're feeling like you're, you should be incorporating these, um, if you like them, sure, absolutely. But you absolutely can have cheese and you can have ground beef in your diet. Um, if you're trying to reduce your saturated fat, maybe just, again, rotating them in with other things that are maybe lower in saturated fat. Um, the next question was, how much water is enough? I'm drinking a lot of water, but I hate having to get up in the night to use the bathroom. Is there a guideline for water intake? Another really good question. So again, I think I touched upon this a bit when we were talking about hydration. Um, everyone's water intake and needs are different. Now, you're right. When we're drinking a lot of water, it does cause us to need to use the bathroom often. Um, there isn't necessarily an exact answer to that, except a lot of people have found some strategies that work for them. So if you find that your urinary frequency is often during the night, if you try to consume more of your fluid throughout the earlier parts of the day and start to taper off maybe right around, right before dinner time, that has a tendency to help with reducing the need to get off during the night. Now, also the idea of sipping on water throughout the course of the day, as opposed to drinking large volumes at one time, has been shown to also be very helpful, as opposed to, um, again, not drinking larger amounts at one time. Um, and then lastly, um, I know berries are good for you, but how about bananas and citrus? Also, if I want to gain weight, is there any reason to limit my nuts to five servings per week? So you, berries are good for you. Um, bananas and citrus are absolutely wonderful as well. So think about what fruits you like the most and think about which ones are easiest for you to have in your diet, are affordable, are, um, and berries can go bad really quickly. So if bananas are easier and, and oranges are easier to have on hand, um, by all means, keep those in the rotation as well. Um, variety. So again, different colors provide different nutrients. So as many different things as you can incorporate, that's great. And then in terms of limiting your, um, your source of uh, amount of nuts that you're having, um, no need to limit your, your servings of nuts to five per week. If you're trying to gain weight, nuts can be really helpful because they do have those rich calories in them. So grabbing a small handful of nuts can be very helpful. Um, sprinkling some nuts or seeds into your cereal or yogurt. Um, using nut or seed butters in, you know, in, in, in a sandwich or with crackers or an apple can also be a really good way to get that. So that's the questions we had from, a, from beforehand. Thank you so much, Liz. And I'll just remind people, please use the Q&A um, if you have any questions um, about nutrition. And uh, we have a couple that came in during the talk. Um, so Liz, first, could you comment on is it okay to take magnesium to help with Parkinson's foot cramping? Um, and do we no need to look at um, the medications specifically before taking magnesium? 
Yeah. So anytime, again, you're taking, you're going to start a supplement, I would always just check with your provider in case there happens to be any type of contraindication with medications that you're taking. Um, magnesium can be very helpful with managing certain things. And oftentimes people can be deficient in magnesium, um, not necessarily as common as like a vitamin D deficiency, um, but it can be helpful to get a blood level and to kind of check to see where things are at at that point. So yes, you can certainly, you know, utilize something like magnesium if you feel like it's um, something that might help. Anytime you start a supplement, um, also kind of giving yourself a guideline for saying, okay, I'm starting this today. Let me see how things go for, you know, a month or two. And if you're taking it for a specific reason, like foot cramping, in those two months, assessing to see how much you feel like it's helping with the foot cramping. So, you know, sometimes people will start a supplement and then just kind of endlessly take it, not really realizing if it's helping or not, which isn't necessarily harmful, but it can be costly and then just be one more thing to take. So if you do decide to take something, um, you know, figuring out what the kind of the, um, the way to measure the success of that is and giving yourself a timeline and say, okay, in two months, I'm going to check in and see if this is helping, I'll continue it. But if I really don't see a difference or a benefit, then maybe just skipping and moving forward. Great. Thanks so much. And then we have a couple of questions on grain here. So first, could you just comment generally on green? Um, someone says they're reading the grain brain um, mm -hmm. and just wants to hear your opinion on um, how yeah. that interacts. Yeah, absolutely. So again, there is not an exact diet that benefits Parkinson's aside from really kind of looking at general healthy eating and nourishment for your body. So there are some kind of theories that maybe certain grains can be problematic or gluten specific can be problematic. Um, until we really see any concrete evidence that something is very beneficial. So for example, people who have celiac disease, we know that gluten is causing damage to the lining of their small intestine. I don't like to restrict people without um, necessarily having that solid reason of it being something beneficial. So when we restrict our diet, it puts us at risk for unintentional weight loss or nutrient deficiencies. So if, again, if someone wants to try something, um, as I was saying, with maybe like the supplements, maybe giving yourself a time frame. So if someone felt strongly about trying a grain-free or gluten-free diet, um, I'm open to supporting for sure. But again, I would give yourself a timeline to say, okay, in one month or two months, let me reassess to see if this is really helping. And if there is no significant benefit to that, then I would really encourage someone to go back to a wide variety of incorporation of these foods. Thanks. And then could you also comment specifically on a seven grain hot cereal like oatmeal? Is something like that something yeah. you would recommend? Yeah, absolutely. So um, cereals can be quick and easy and helpful um, in our diet for various reasons. Um, a lot of people like hot cereal, especially in the colder weather. Oatmeal is wonderful, a great source of, of fiber. Um, there can be other grains though to, to use as hot cereal if oatmeal is not your thing. Um, I've heard of people really liking buckwheat as a cereal or even um, cooking quinoa and, and making it a little soupier and warming it up to be more cereal consistency with some cinnamon and sugar um, to kind of be um, delicious like that. So again, really it's to your liking. And if that's something that you enjoy, there can be some really great benefits. And just to clarify, it's um, seven grain soluble. Okay, is that a specific cereal that they're referencing? Um, I'm not sure. Okay. I can check on that. If it, if, um, if it is, okay. I was gonna say, if it is one that's um, like a, a specific or like, a, like an oatmeal type cereal that has multiple grains in it, um, again, thinking about variety, the more variety of different grains we get, the more different nutrients and fiber that we're getting. So I, I would absolutely support that. Great. And then um, something else I was wondering if you could comment on is we've seen an increase in interest in intermittent fasting. Mm. Um, do you have any um, concerns about intermittent fasting or techniques that you recommend for patients? Yeah. So as a dietitian, I, I do have concerns about intermittent fasting in the sense that, 
you know, we're already looking at timing often for people who are taking Parkinson's medication with trying to get enough of their nutrients throughout the day. So then when we add in intermittent fasting, it's causing further limitations, which may cause some further complications in the sense of, you know, nutrient deficiencies or not able to get enough nutrients throughout the day, but also looking at just caloric intake. You know, we can only take in so many calories at a sitting. So if we're shortening the span of time that we're allowing ourselves to eat, then we're, we're likely not going to get as many of those nutrients or as many of those calories as we're able to get. So, um, you know, I, I strongly encourage people to not intermittent fast. Um, you know, again, if they wanted to give it a try for some specific reason, um, you know, we, I would work closely with them to say, okay, let's very carefully try this. But um, again, I really would steer people away from that as much as possible. Great. Well, I think um, that is all the Q&A that we have right now. Um, thank you so much, Liz, yeah, for absolutely. taking the time today. Um, and thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, I don't see anything else coming in, so we can probably wrap it up just a little bit early so everyone can go out and enjoy finally a warm, yes. sunny week. <laughs> um, but we have recorded this talk and should be uploading it to our YouTube channel sometime next week. So as soon as that's up, we can send that around. And if you have any questions um, after you've gone through and thought about this talk a little bit more, please feel free to send them along to me. Um, and then we can try to answer your questions afterwards. So mm -hmm. thank you all again so much and have a good rest of your day. Thank you so much too. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye.